I think we'll get started. We'll probably still have people come in. Uh, my name is Casey Larochelle. I'm with Finesse in Administration and Strategic Partnerships. I'm uh, zooming in from Sanaimo Territory on Vancouver Island in Nanaimo. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Indigenous Information Session on Drought Preparedness and Response. The meeting's being recorded and we'll edit it and send a link out. The agenda is embedded in the calendar invite. So I'll call upon people as I see them on my screen. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, if you're from a community, uh, your position within the community, your expectations of the meeting, and a question that you may have specifically about drought. Uh, we'll try to keep the introductions brief. And if you're from a partner organization, um, your name and your position would suffice. Um, so I'd like to start with Maeve uh, Coakley. Oh, Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Maeve. I am just uh, newly onboarding with FNHA in the Vancouver Island region, specifically the New Channels territories. And I am um, zooming in today from the traditional unceded territories of the Shot and Hupetjeset people. Um, my my new role is uh, community coordinator, crisis response, and um, I don't I don't think I have a specific question about drought today. I think as we go on and um, we learn a bit more, I I will have some questions. But for now, um, hello. Thank you very much, uh, the one and only Melissa Aird. Good afternoon. Um, it's so great to see everyone. My name is Melissa Aird. I'm Soto First Nation from Northern British Columbia, but joining today from Liquita Territory and Campbell River. And I am the Vancouver Island Regional Health Emergency Manager. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Ray Riley, one of our presenters. If you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, yes, thanks, Casey. Can you hear me there? Perfectly. <clears throat> great, thank you. Uh, my name is Ray Riley. I'm working with uh, Ministry of Forests, Water Management Branch out of Victoria. And today I am zooming in from the traditional territory of the Okanagan Seal people. And I would say I am uh, particularly lucky to be living and working in this uh, part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Eric Blaney. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my traditional name is Tiapto. My English name is Eric Blaney. I'm from the Tlaman First Nation and uh, calling in from uh, the uh, Vancouver Territory, though, Squamish, Tooth, and Musqueam. And uh, really good to uh, hear some familiar voices here on the call. Thanks for having me. Super great to have you in the workshop, Eric. Uh, Crystal Nahani. Thank you, Casey. Chuk Maha, Sansa Wizamga, Kuyan Pashamain. Are you well? Sansa Wizamga is my ancestral name. I work for FNHA as the operations specialist, and I'm calling in today from the village of Kwamalchistan, a Squamish Nation village, and we fall within the shared territory of Slewatooth and Musqueam. Thank you, Casey. Thank you very much. Uh, Daryl Adrian. Hey, Casey. Yeah, thanks for today. And, and thanks. It's great to see everybody's uh, on the call here today. Yeah, Daryl Adrian at the Little Tribal Council uh, here in the Northern Stadlium, uh, born and raised here. Uh, happy to be working here as well. Uh, thanks for today, Casey. Thank you, Daryl. Bruce McDonald. Good day, Casey. Bruce McDonald from La Jaco Dene in Quinell and a land manager here. And I guess a question I had about drought is, is this one of the years, worst years we have had in the province of BC in the last 10 years? Good question. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Gordon. Gordon, if you're available. Uh, 
Mike Jordan Anthony here from the Scotland Band in Indian Chair and just joining in to learn about drought. And I guess if I had a question, I guess it would be how it's related to watersheds also a little bit and and the relationship on uh, fires and all that that's happening also. Okay, thanks, bye. Thank you for that, Chris Marsh. Yeah, thanks, Casey, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Marsh. I'm an emergency management advisor for the Tanaka Nation Council. Um, calling in today from uh, the Trail Rosland area, which is uh, traditional and unceded uh, Sinaiq, Silk, and uh, Tanaka territory. Um, yeah, I guess my my question is, uh, I'm wondering, you know, how the weather pattern we're experiencing right now is going to change our kind of our short and long term drought conditions. So. Uh, looking forward to the session. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Christine Abbott. Good action, one one. Christine Abbott, Lytton First Nation Operations and Maintenance, Assistant to Program Manager Warren Brown. Question about drought. Hmm. Is it related to the watershed? Is it related to global warming? Is what? Can we expect with um, no moisture for the root systems in the mountainsides? And what are the plants? <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. Ian Cunnings. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Ian Cunnings. I'm uh, the Senior Director for Regional Operations at EMCR. Uh, and today I'm calling in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Kitsi First Nations. And uh, thanks again for the invite, Casey. Thank you, Ian. Zaina West. Hi, Casey. I'm Zaina West, and I am the Occupational Health and Safety Emergency Preparedness Officer for the Moachuk Matalot First Nation. And I guess my question is, I just want to learn as much as I can about drought and how, what we can use to mitigate the effects of it and, and just learn more so that we can deal with it in the future effectively. Thank you very much, Sana. Trudy Peterson. Good afternoon, everyone. Just um, seeing what information is out there, seeing how things have been um, updated or, or how information is getting disseminated and seeing what kind of planning we can do. Thank you, Trudy. Charlene Joe. Uh, I'm just commenting that I wasn't aware of that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlene Joe. I'm the Indigenous Engagement Manager for the City of Merritt. Um, also board of director for finesse. Um, thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Jeremiah Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeremiah Lewis. I'm the fire chief emergency program coordinator for Tacla Nation. Um, uh, my question about drought would be when we knew that there'd be some serious drought in the north here, uh, Back in April, we were getting forecasted for the unprecedented drought conditions here. Um, it still seemed like we weren't prepared. So I'm just wondering, and that was from a ministry person, how is ministry going to use their own data? So thanks. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, John Curvell. Uh, I'm a name good day. Uh, happy to be here. Um, Given English name John Carbell, um, hold a hereditary chieftainship name with the Niska Nation within Wilts Gatan, which is Flitic. Happy to be here. Uh, I come from EMCR, uh, calling in from uh, the unceded territories of the Stenamuk Nation. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Casey. Thank you for joining. Uh, Shane Wardrobe. Uh, thanks, Casey. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Shane Wardrobe, to come with Schwetten, Emergency Manager, Emergency Planning Coordinator. Um, for, my question would be, what will it take for us to get our drought levels back down to uh, normal or non-existent? And uh, also looking for any ideas and and uh, on funding for drought preparedness and planning. And I just want to thank uh, Casey and Finesse for all the great work that they do in providing all of that kind of information for us. And thanks for putting this on today. You're very welcome. Hample R, R Hample. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rahul Hampel. I'm a senior engineer with Indigenous Services uh, Canada. I'm zooming in from the traditional territory of Sanemo people. I'm glad to be here uh, and presenting. Thank you very much. Uh, Patricia Alec. Hello, my name is Patricia Alec. I'm a first responder and I am uh, zooming in from Shamakamban. Um, just wanting to learn about the drought and what kind of plans there are. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rob Fleming. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> hello everybody, my name is Rob Fleming and I'm the manager of the Drinking Water Safety Program for First Nations Health. And I'm calling in from the traditional territories of the Tecumnic Shweptic peoples. Um, I'm really interested in source water monitoring, both quantity and quality. So looking to see what the future is to you know, see those trends and monitoring that piece. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Kara Meganberg. Hi there. I'm here today with the Health Emergency Management Team of the First Nations Health Authority Northern Region. And we're coming to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Claydley Tene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jackie Wilson. Sorry, Jackie, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Jackie Wilson. I am the partnership coordinator for the Northwest region of EMCR, uh, located on the traditional territory of the Ginnendum clan of the Wet'suwet'en people. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Connie Chapman. Thanks, Casey. I'm Connie Chapman. I'm with the Ministry of Forest Water Management Branch, and I'm calling in today from the lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam, and thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Susan, uh, if you could introduce yourself, Susan. Susan Napoleon and Squatucha. Um, good afternoon. My name is Susan Napoleon. I am, my main job is education coordinator, but I do hold the Emergency Operations Centre Director and the Emergency Social Services Director for my community of Tlitkit. And um, I guess just here to um learn more about drought and um how to help get get out of it or something thank you thank you very much i see a david um no last name david if you can introduce yourself sure thanks casey um oh my slider on uh, it's David Hewson. I'm from uh, KPMG. I'm here to support Ian Cunnings in the uh, presentation later on in the agenda. Uh, and I'm calling in from uh, Lekwungen territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. Anthony Hanfield. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Casey. Uh, my name is Anthony Hadfield. I'm the Regional uh, Manager for Emergency Management for, for ISC in BC region. Uh, today, I am on the traditional territory of the Katsi First Nation, and I'm really happy to be. So uh, one question I have, um, not being an engineer, is what impact or what? how can we mitigate the impacts of, of the weather and climate uh, just by having well-maintained infrastructure? That would be something, uh, and, and the right infrastructure. So that would be a question I would have. Uh, but uh, nice to be nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you. 
Crystal Camille. Good afternoon, everyone. Crystal Camille. I'm the executive assistant here at Finesse. Happy to be here. Thank you, Crystal. Judy Mitchell. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Mitchell. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the South Coast Nations of Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Shishalp, and Tla'aman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim McDonald. Yep. Afternoon, everybody. Nice to see so many familiar faces, by the way. Um, and I am uh, with Finesse. I'm the team lead for both the preparedness and recovery departments. And I'm calling from the traditional homeland of the Stalo people. And I'm just hoping to get enough information on this that we can start putting some concrete plans into place. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Michelle Jacobs. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, everybody lost my mouse. Uh, Michelle Jacobs with Finesse. I am a technical trainer for decision support. Thank you very much. Lucas Valtry. If you're able. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lucas Valtry, Newhawk Nation EPC, calling in today from the traditional unceded territory of the Newhawk people in what is known as the Bellacoola Valley. I'm looking forward to learning uh, about what resources are available uh, to create plans and what funding programs are available related to drought. Thanks. Thank you. Calvin Smith. All right, Calvin Smith from Schmuckenbad. O&M Operation and Maintenance. Just here to learn a bit about drought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amanda Dixon. Good afternoon, everyone. My traditional name is Kilalas Kilala. My given name is Amanda. I'm calling in from the traditional territory of the Shishas Nation as Shishas Health Manager. Uh, I have a question. Well, my question about drought today is I'm more interested in knowing what our neighboring nations drought response plan is and also here to learn how we can implement more of a drought response here in my community. Thank you for the opportunity for letting me be here today. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, Brett Uphill. QC Kewitt. My name is Brett Uphill. I'm the um, manager of fire and emergency services for Yakadak Nikliet Tobacco Plains. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Ross. Hello there. My name is Chris Ross from the First Nations Health Authority Provincial uh, HEM team. I am a training and exercise uh, specialist. I'm curious to see if there's any uh, larger scale programs in place or if uh, plans in place for next year if the drought conditions from this year continue. Thank you very much. Uh, Grant Bird. Hi there, everyone. My name is Grant Bird. Um, I'm the new crisis response coordinator for FNHA in the Vancouver Island region. Um, I'm just wanting to learn more about um, any resources, anything that I can learn to apply to my role and working with the Coast Salish family. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Nikki Sadat. You're on mute, I think, Nikki. Uh, can anyone hear Nikki? I hope it's just not me. <laughs> If no one else can hear Nikki, uh, maybe we'll try to circle back. Uh, Amber Lee. Hi, good afternoon.
afternoon. Um, my name is Amber Lee. I'm the Regional Manager for Environmental Public Health Services with uh, Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Salish Regions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Anthony Sapaya. Hi, Casey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, Ananthan Sapaya. I am a manager at uh, Indigenous Services Canada, and I'm um, happy to be calling in from the uh, traditional unceded territories of the uh, Squamish, uh, Silvertooth, and Musqueam Nations. Glad to be here. I'm here mainly to listen and understand how we can better support communities. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for calling you, Anthony. Uh, Christina Kalp Calbreath. Uh, Jeanette Atia, I'm Christina Colbreth from uh, the uh, Cheltan Nation. I am the Deese Lake uh, Community Director. So I just wanted to come here and learn more about drought preparedness. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Brown. Hi, Casey. Tom Brown, uh, Director of Emergency Management for the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation joining from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, and uh, really appreciate Finesse putting on this uh, this workshop. Thank you, Casey. Oh, you're very welcome. Alex Hebert. Hi, everyone. I am a recovery and ESS specialist with Finesse, and I'm calling in today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sail Tokenogan people. Thank you. Uh, Clint Williams. I am Clint Williams with the Mutsmot uh, Travel Council, Emergency Preparedness Advisor. I'm um, uh, joining the call here today, hoping that uh, there may be some advances in forecasting and uh, preparedness or preparations that we might be able to pass some advice along to our community. Good to see you, Clint. Clara Smith. Good afternoon, Claire Smith here. I'm the acting administrator for Shimakwam. I'm interested in uh, what everybody else is preparing for, uh, resourcing, uh, and responding to uh, the drought conditions. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Robert Cosma. If you're available, Robert. I am uh, Robert Cosmo. I am uh, Emergency uh, Service Coordinator with TNG, uh, the Chicago National Government, and I'm here to uh, learn as much information as I possibly can. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, do you want to try to introduce yourself, see if your volume works? And is there anyone else uh, that I haven't seen on my screen that would like to introduce themselves? Um, jump in or raise your hand. I think we've got everyone. Well, thank you all for all the great questions. Um, I find it really interesting hearing all the questions from, from different perspectives. I'd like to uh, introduce Ray Riley, who will be doing the first presentation on the BC Drought Information Portal. And if you have a presentation, uh, feel free to share screen it. And I can confirm that it's on the screen for you. Okay, let me just uh, do that right now. I will share screen first. You'll probably see my family. And then I will start the presentation. We're good. Okay, so you can see that uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so thanks very much everybody for joining today and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we've already been through the introduction, so I think I'll skip part of this. My name is Ray Riley, working for Water Management Branch, Ministry of Forests. Uh, the, I'll just say the drought information portal is uh, managed by the Ministry of Forests. It's our responsibility to keep it updated and, uh, and uh, we do that work and we, and we take it seriously. So uh, I was asked to talk about the drought information portal specifically. Um, so the portal is the reporting location for drought related data, including the drought levels for all the water basins in the province. Uh, it includes the discharge and stream level data from the Water Survey of Canada gauges. It includes the snow basin indices uh, through the winter and into the spring. It 
It includes groundwater level data from the Provincial Groundwater Observation Well Network, and it includes other things like the historical drought information. So the drought information portal, uh, just got a picture of the landing screen on the right-hand side there when you go to it. Uh, it's updated weekly during the drought season. Um, it also includes information about regional specific data on watersheds of concern. Uh, on, on the left-hand side here, you can see there are links to drought level bulletins. Uh, as the drought levels move, the province might send out uh, information bulletins or news releases, and those will be linked right there. And then there's also links to angling closures uh, if, uh, if those are occurring as well as a result of drought. So the, the, the main purpose of the, of the portal is to uh, report out on the drought levels. Um, I think I mentioned before that those are updated weekly. Uh, the, the process for doing that is uh, as follows. The, the River Forecast Center looks at the primary criteria on the right-hand side there, I've got a little uh, table that shows the in-season drought criteria, uh, the core indicators of the seven-day average stream flow and the 30-day precipitation. So the river forecast looks at those two primary criteria and they look at the forecast of what's coming in the next several days or week. Then they make their preliminary drought level recommendations. Uh, they send those over to us, Water Management Branch. We share them out with the regional drought response teams those regional drought response teams have a meeting once a week where they sit down, look at the recommendations, then they incorporate their own local information, which would be taken up by the uh, supplemental indicators part on the right-hand side there. So they uh, sit down, look at the draft, the recommended drought levels, they incorporate their supplemental indicators, then they'll make a decision what they want locally as far as the drought levels go. And they'll be using the scale here from zero to five uh, that you can see on the, uh, on the screen there. So after those uh, decisions are made, the drought levels come back where they're incorporated into the drought portal and they're reported a couple of different ways. One is this table, you can see along the left-hand side, it has the 34 basins in the province. Across the top are the weekly time steps for uh, every, uh, every week when the decisions are made. And then a little reminder on the color graph, the color chart there about what each drought level means, zero being the green and five being that dark red uh, sort of brownie color almost. So this is a really quick, easy way to see how the drought has progressed across the province. Uh, uh, it's quite, quite visual. Uh, the second way that shows it on the drought portal is by the map, uh, another easy way to look at it. Uh, so this shows each basin in the province and the drought level that they're currently at, same color scheme. And then on the right-hand side of this, um, it shows uh, by category, by drought level, one through five, how many of the basins are in each. And then if you click on the little arrow tab on the right-hand side of that, uh, it'll show you by name, by which, uh, which drought portal they're there, or which, uh, sorry, water basin each one of those uh, levels is. Uh, I mentioned there's a few other things that the portal shows. Uh, one of them is the groundwater levels and mapping uh, with the aquifers. Um, I've zoomed in a little bit here just to show part of the lower mainland and each one of these red dots or green or blue or the darker colors uh, are part of the provincial observation, the groundwater observation well network. And the uh, colors represent uh, where the ground level, where the water level is below ground relative to its uh, normal position. So uh, the lower it is down, uh, the darker the color in the red, uh, the green means it's in sort of the normal range of where we would expect it to, and then the, uh, the gradations in between. Uh, on this sort of screen capture, I also just turned on the um, mapped aquifers just to show uh, where some of those are on uh, lower mainland, and southern Vancouver Island there. Uh, it kind of helps show um, where maybe there's some stacked aquifers or multiple aquifers and it, and it shows the extent of the mapping. Uh, one of the other interesting things I wanted to mention was um, this uh, historical drought information tab. Now these tabs I'm talking about are, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not circling over on this right-hand tab here. There's a number of different things, the groundwater, 
the seven day precipitate or the seven day uh, mean annual discharge flows, and then this uh, historical drought information. So you can go back and choose one of the previous years. There is this time lapse across the bottom. You just hit the play button and it'll show you how the drought developed that year across the different basins. On the right hand column here, it shows that same drought level map. So you can see in this 2022 uh, picture here, that there was a lot of green at the beginning of the year, more than there was this year. Then there was that yellow of the one and twos. Then in certain locations, we got into the level fours and fives. And below that, there's a little just a text synopsis of what that uh, drought year looked like. So this historical information is pretty good for um, context. It, uh, it shows us, you know, we can look back and say, what was it like last year? What was it like the year before? I remember maybe 21 was a bad year. You could go back and compare the two. So uh, there's some interesting information there. Um, I'm looking at my timer running. I promised to be in at about seven minutes. And I think I'm coming up on the, about seven minutes. So I think I'll just leave it there and say thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, I know there's probably a lot more questions coming out of the drought portal uh, than I really had time to go through. This was just a quick skate over the, uh, over the pond on, on what's included there. But uh, I will be on the call for the rest of the session if uh, people have questions, if they wanted to reach out in the chat or, uh, or whatever. So thanks very much. And uh, send it back to you, Casey. Thank you very much, Ray. We'll save uh, questions until the end. And if the presenters could put their name and position and email in the chat, maybe people can also uh, follow up and email questions after if that's okay. And we'll share the presentations with people along with the link of the recording. Uh, next on the presentation, First Nations and Local Authority Emergency Management Plan for water scarcity template. Uh, Ian Cunning, please. Yeah, thanks, Casey. And uh, just before I share my screen, uh, just put a link in the chat uh, to where uh, the EMCR uh, drill planning tools are, uh, both uh, the uh, template uh, document uh, as well as an overview of what's available, uh, which uh, you're about to hear more from. Uh, but with that, um, uh, just before I uh, jump over to uh, David to walk us through uh, some work that we had KPMG for us in developing the tools, that I'm hoping this isn't the first time uh, the folks on the call are seeing this. This is something that uh, got shared uh, earlier in the summer, uh, both, uh, I believe, through finesse contacts uh, as well as EMCR to uh, Indigenous and local governments. So, uh, and uh, as Casey has suggested, I'll put my name and contact info in the chat. So if we did miss you, uh, we, we can reconnect uh, after this call today and make sure we have you on the right distribution list. So with that, uh, I'll jump into sharing my screen here to bring up uh, our presentation and uh, David uh, will kick it over uh, to you. Just let me know uh, when you would uh, like me to move through the screens. Sure, thanks Ian. Just checking, you can hear me all right? Absolutely. Yeah. And Casey, is there a hard stop for time? Uh, maybe if you could try to keep it within 10-ish, maybe 15 sure. max. That's great. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Okay. Well, thanks Ian and thanks Casey. Um, yeah, as, as Ian mentioned, uh, this might be a repeat presentation for a handful of folks that have attended some of the seasonal readiness meetings uh, that occurred in the spring and uh, kind of early summertime. But um, I'm just going to walk through a tool that we, uh, our team, uh, KPFG, worked with EMCR to develop over the uh, spring and summer. Uh, so you can slip to the, or flip to the next slide there, Ian. Uh, just a bit of a primer, which probably not necessary with the earlier conversations uh, around drought, but uh, drought is uh, in BC. Uh, uh, essentially uh, accumulation of or uh, 
a function of uh, insufficient snow accumulation, uh, dry or hot weather, uh, delays in rainfall, um, and uh, uh, can lead to a number of impacts across society. So a handful have been listed on the screen here, community use, responder use, environmental needs, agricultural use, economic use. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, lack of water has uh, widespread implications for communities and society. Um, and you can probably flip through the next uh, two or three fairly quickly, but we'll go to the next slide. Um, so we just saw in the past presentation, uh, the uh, uh, table of this year's uh, drought levels. And so uh, for the previous presentations, I wanted to note where uh, the 2022 drought levels were. And if you hit the next slide there, Ian, uh, it'll pull up the 2023 uh, version uh, or of the, the drought levels for BC. Uh, of course, they've progressed a bit more since this presentation has been developed, but uh, essentially the columns align with one another. You can see the levels of drought relative to uh, the previous year and uh, where each of those uh, drought levels reached to across uh, the previous year. Um, so one of the key points in this slide is that the drought effects are cumulative. And so last year's season and ending the, the year with uh, high levels of drought has implications for this year, which was partly the impetus for developing uh, the water scarcity tool that I'll, I'll uh, describe in a, a moment here. So you can skip to the next slide, Ian. Uh, just a quick uh, summary on what products are out there right now. Uh, so there's a number of uh, provincial, local, and water supplier specific products uh, uh, that can help with planning. Uh, if you can hit the next slide button there again. Um, just highlight the provincial side first. So at the provincial level for plans, there's uh, at the all hazards level, the all hazard plan, which covers all uh, types of events, including drought within the province. And then there's the BC emergency management system, which covers the approach that the province takes to managing emergencies. And then for specific to drought and water scarcity, there's the drought uh, and water scarcity response plan, uh, which was uh, published last year uh, in August. Uh, then we can move to the water, or sorry, the local products there, Ian. Hit the next slide, please. Uh, at the all hazard level for local products, there's the local uh, emergency management plan template, which is essentially the all hazards template communities can use. And then there's the hazard risk and vulnerability analysis tool, which can help identify risks uh, in relation to all hazards, but also drought. Uh, hit the next slide there for me. Uh, and for the water suppliers specifically, there's a number of products, uh, uh, including the dealing with uh, Dealing with Drought, a handbook for suppliers, uh, and then another product associated with the Drinking Water Protection Act, uh, which is the Emergency Response and Contingency Planning for Small Water Systems Guide, which is connected to regulatory requirements for water suppliers. And then lastly, hit the slide one more time, Ian, uh, is the template that we worked on uh, this past year to focus on more of the local context uh, specific to drought and water scarcity. So this is a template focused in this space and just wanted to give a snapshot of all these products to show you where this fit. Um, hey, David. Yes. Um, I don't know how it looks on other screens, but on mine, it it's just a really small symbol of the page. So I don't know if your intent is to show the, the full page or just the just the small box among several when you advance the slides. Yeah, I'm just trying to highlight each of the products. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, uh, we'll get into the, the content of the plan in the next slide here, but just trying to show a map of, there's a number of different documents and products in this space. And I just want to show that this is specific to First Nations and uh, local authority planning and specific to the drought and water scarcity context. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but thanks for pointing that out, Casey. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, so we've been talking about drought, but the plan or the template itself focuses more on a broader concept of water scarcity, which could be drought, but is uh, not limited to drought. Uh, it's essentially any type of event where water supply uh, exceeds, uh, sorry, water demand exceeds water supply. So that could be 
challenges due to infrastructure capacity, uh, condition or failure, contamination of your water supply, or limitations on available storage. Um, can advance to the next slide there, Ian. The context for developing this template uh, was back in February. Uh, the recognition of the drought uh, risk led to a consideration for developing a tool specific to First Nations and local authority planning efforts. Uh, and the intention was to ultimately reduce the risk of water scarcity events, including drought, and support more coordinated efforts across the province uh, for drought related planning response. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's skip to the next slide there, Ian. What was in scope for this product was more focusing on two of the four phases of emergency management. So, preparedness and response, considering uh, First Nations aspects uh, of planning efforts, not just for First Nations that use the tool or the template, but also local authorities with neighboring First Nations. And then also considering uh, well, or focusing on what the local water supply and local water demand considerations are. Uh, also, I work with a number of logistics and supply chain professionals, and that was a big effort in building up the concepts and approaches to logistics to support uh, water scarcity or drought uh, events uh, to build out those processes specific to bringing in water supply. What was out of scope is a deep analysis into the mitigation or recovery side of uh, droughts, um, looking at improvements to water infrastructure that are outside of emergency events. Uh, and then also the catastrophic side of water scarcity or, or water uh, supply disruptions. So uh, this is not intended to take on uh, earthquake uh, type uh, water scarcity events. And it also isn't intended to take the place of other community policies or bylaws. Uh, you can skip to the next slide there, Ian. In, uh, in addition to the template, there's also a response placemat that consolidates uh, a lot of the content from the template into a single page or a two page product uh, that uh, lists out the various response uh, processes and uh, information that might be useful to have quick at hand. Uh, it also includes key contacts and resources that might be useful to support more rapid planning efforts. Can skip to the next slide. Uh, there's also an approach uh, that's outlined at the beginning of the plan that uh, helps with more rapid planning efforts. So uh, there's a suggested approach if you only have an afternoon or so to kick off your planning effort. Uh, so where you can target that approach uh, and then uh, you can go through a more thorough planning effort when there's more time or resources available to go through that. But uh, understanding that everyone in emergency management is busy is busy we wanted to provide a bit of a targeted approach to developing out the key content within your plan we can skip to the next slide Ian. so getting into the content within the plan itself uh, there's a section that focuses on the scope of the product uh, so whether it's a community or a regional scope for your planning effort what geographic boundaries your plan may cover, the types of events, whether it's specific to just drought or all water scarcity type events, and who might be involved in either the planning or response effort. And then in addition to confirming or identifying your scope, uh, there's uh, some guidance around identifying and uh, putting boundaries around your water supply sources. Uh, so which local water sources your community relies on, uh, what their minimum flow rates or levels are, any high risk seasons or periods for those uh, water sources, and then also demand and splitting that demand up by various categories and understanding their respective flow rates. Uh, so capturing all that uh, important context uh, on the outset. Within the product is also some guidance around setting up your response structure specific to drought and water scarcity. Uh, there's a lot of commonalities between uh, response structure for other emergencies, but there are some nuances, particularly on the procurement of certain types of supplies like packaged water, bottled water, sourcing bulk water, critical parts that might be needed to augment a uh, infrastructure system. And so some guidance is included within the template for uh, those unique parts of the response structure as well. 
You can skip to the next slide there, Ian. Um, within the product as well includes a number of response measures. Uh, so this includes community action. So uh, activities that can be taken outside of formal policy measures to uh, potentially reduce demand for water, uh, as well as a series of policy options that can be considered um, going from public information to formal community policies to user restrictions and then the use of legislative tools. And then there's four sets of logistics options spanning across packaged water, which is uh, bottled water or jugged water, and then bulk water, bringing in water from another jurisdiction, uh, considering mobile water treatment plants um, or mobile water treatment systems that can be brought in, and then augmenting your system or repairing it with critical parts. So there's a number of uh, considerations and guidance around each of these uh, response measures. And then uh, we'll skip to the next slide there, Ian. Let's just go through these quickly. There's a number of appendices within the product as well uh, that can help you deepen your planning effort. Uh, some content around deepening your understanding of your supply. So what your water supply is, what your local water demand is. There's also a water scarcity specific risk assessment that can help uh, identify what the uh, greatest concerns are or hazards that may cause water scarcity within your community. So we can skip to the next slide. And then there's a number of appendices that support uh, deeper planning efforts around logistics. Uh, so more considerations around how you would plan for packaged water, bulk water, water treatment systems, and then some tables that can help you track and actually use those uh, logistic measures effectively and uh, organize your response. And then finally, there's some guidance around engagement and communication materials that can support um, developing materials specific to water scarcity response. I think that might be the last slide. So I went a few minutes over, Casey. Hopefully that's all right. It's all good. Thank you, David. Uh, the last presentation, and then we'll do questions and answers, is funding, especially for response, recovery, and supports. And I'm not sure if uh, ISC or EMCR is going to go first. So maybe someone can let me know. Casey, I'm uh, happy to start and then uh, turn it over to our partners at ISC if that works. Perfect. And I'm just going to uh, share my screen again and put a link in uh, the chat here as well so people will have access to what I'm about to show. So again, uh, this shouldn't be uh, new information uh, for people, uh, but from a uh, preparation uh, and planning uh, perspective uh, through the UBCM, and the Community uh, Emergency Preparedness Funding. Uh, we do have uh, one of, uh, there's a number of other eligible uh, emergency-related funding streams that I would encourage people to look at uh, at their leisure. And if you have any questions, uh, there's an email link uh, under Contact Us on the UBCM page. Uh, or drop me an email and I'll do my best uh, to answer or get an answer for you. Uh, but you'll note that the Disaster Risk and Climate Adaptation Fund uh, has an intake that is open uh, up until uh, October 6, 2023. Uh, so fairly uh, tight timeline, uh, but again, timing uh, uh, again, uh, I'm not sure if Casey mentioned, we had hoped to uh, pull this session off uh, a month ago, but for obvious reasons and extreme wildfire activity, that just wasn't possible. But just flagging from a preparedness perspective uh, and looking at what uh, climate risk, uh, which would include drought, might be for communities uh, and what planning may need to happen there 
that the CEPF funding is available uh, and folks should consider uh, getting an application in uh, by the October 6th deadline. Uh, from a response perspective, uh, right now, uh, EMCR, outside of our normal supports for, say, an EOC activation, would be able to assist with uh, helping you locate uh, bulk water for drinking uh, for public safety purposes and the transportation uh, of that water. And then uh, we've also been able to assist. Uh, we have a couple of communities uh, on Vancouver Island uh, with additional EOC uh, positions directly tied to uh, response. So right now, uh, EMCR through CEPF are able to assist with some planning dollars uh, that are available there. And then some response costs uh, largely tied to uh, helping locate and for the transportation of water. So with that, Casey, uh, I'll kick it over to our partners at ISC. Thank you, Ian. I'll uh, share my screen. Let me know if you can share the presentation slides. So you'll share them? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try at least. Can you see the screen? Uh, no. Okay. So Casey, it's probably best if you do it. You know, I'm not used to the... Okay, I'm just having a look for mine. Just bear with me. I'm going to get rid of a few windows here. Sorry, everyone. Let me see if I can... Can you see now? Sir, I'm just pulling up mine. Yep, I okay. can see yours now. Okay. So you're good to go. Perfect. Okay, so, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rahul Hampal, and uh, I'm a senior engineer with uh, Indigenous Services Canada. Um, so for today's presentation, what I what we had envisioned is we'll try to give a um, an all. Um, um, and all ISC perspective on how some of the drought response and prepared neck activities have um, um, happened. Um, so I'm just, uh, I think I have the wrong screen here that I need. Perfect, so this is, uh, okay. Sorry, just a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, yeah, so so for the first a little bit, I'll just talk about from the CI point of view, uh, what uh, um, what we have uh, on the CI front on the technical end, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll just uh, hand it over to uh, my colleague, Anthony, uh, to talk about uh, some of the emergency management unit and how they plug in. Um, so what does CI do? We are a technical unit. We pro uh, primarily our role is to provide uh, technical support for funding applications that come in from First Nations communities. Um, when should a First Nation contact community infrastructure directorate for um, um, support? Um, uh, it's when you know you have a failure of a critical subcomponent in a water system, that is if you have a failure of a pump, uh, if you have a failure of any of the unit processes that are in 
the water treatment plant or in the distribution system. Um, and then, of course, if you have and if the community is facing a do not consume advisory um, from First Nations Health Authority for whichever reason, be it uh, fuel leak or pathogens, uh, we will uh, we will step in to provide the support for the community if it's something that is out of uh, their usual O and M. Um, prolonged power outages. So that's another situation where uh, CI can provide support. Um, so in terms of uh, a drought, uh, the last event that ISC had um, uh, experienced uh, with First Nations was in 2015, and we had to um, provide some response services to three out of 150 uh, uh, community systems. So this just speaks to um, uh, some of the uh, good work that is happening on the ground by First Nations operators by keeping an eye on their systems and making sure that they are their water systems are resilient. Um, so what are the programs that provide support to the First Nations water systems? Uh, we have two, pa two major pathways, at least. Uh, so one is the, um, the urgent o and uh, program, uh, which provides funding support to First Nations when a community water system is an, unable to meet the demand for drinking water as a result of an emergency. So this will be things like, you know, you have a critical pump failure, or if there is a situation where the water intake is not working. Um, so in, in, in that particular situation, urgent o &M can step in and can have that fast response uh, to the community. So uh, easier way to think about it is, is the urgent o &M will kick in when there is no extended engineering work needed. So we're not talking about redesign, we're not talking about expansion, we're not talking about upgrade. Potentially what we're talking about is straight replacement of parts. Um, so the second one is uh, the capital program. Capital program is- Hey Rahul. So, yes. Um, do you want me to advance the slides? I've got it open um, or were you just kind of going uh, verbatim? Oh, uh, you know, uh, so I think it would be it would be easier if you can do that because okay. can you see the switch off my slides or no, no hey? Oh, you're you're advancing it. I was just wondering if you're going to advance your screens at all. So oh, there okay. we go. You advanced it now. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, you know, I'm just not used to the Zoom. I'm I'm still getting orientated on this. So now you can see the uh, the second slide. It says number yep. two. Okay, we can. perfect. Great. Um, so, so again, you know, sorry about that. Um, so at the very at the very bottom, you can see here there are two um, um, uh, two programs: urgent O and M, quick action response. Uh, we're talking about replacement of parts. Uh, capital program is major funding, major capital project funding, long range planning. Uh, this will be where we will require studies, engineering work, and typically the life cycle of a capital project will be somewhere around two to five years from feasibility to design to construction. So again, you know, something to keep in mind in terms of how at least we are internally organized to respond to some of these uh, um, situations. Um, so in, in, in terms of for this year, how have we, uh, you know, we have been supporting uh, some of the preparedness and re resiliency for the community water systems. And we've done that in a couple of ways um, is, is first of all was to just raise the awareness by distributing the drought and water shortage tip sheet and frequently asked questions, uh, which focused on things like the importance of an emergency response plan, the conservation uh, measures, uh, the importance of having uh, the leak detection work and having an idea of the distribution system and any of the sort of the vulnerabilities that exist there um, in, in terms of the water wastage in the distribution system itself. And of course, how can communities approach ISC uh, for bulk water and bottled water acquisition and transport? So within, within, the, uh, within these uh, documents, we, we were able to include some of the information from our partners from the province of BC and also from FNHA. So we were able to include those resources and distribute it um, um, electronically via email earlier, like uh, in late July. Um, the second thing is identification of the vulnerable systems and outreach. I'll talk about it in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, and then, of course, continued coordination with the First Nations partners, Finesse, FNHA, BCFN, 
and provide uh, and the province to leverage the capacity and resources of each agency in support of First Nations. So again, you know, being part of those conversations, uh, being part and being part of those meetings at those tables and providing them updates and getting those up, uh, valuable updates from the partners so that we can have a good idea of uh, where we can step in to uh, fulfill First Nation needs. Um, so this is uh, uh, just a bit of a methodology of how we have, um, uh, you know, tried to sort of wrap our head around um, what is the current situation. So as part of this exercise, uh, we took the last five years of data um, out of the annual performance inspections. So for people who are not aware, annual performance inspection is an ISC funded program uh, that inspects all um, um, ISC funded uh, water and base that inspects all ISC funded uh, water and wastewater systems on an annual basis. So we have been doing this uh, inspection program since 2010. So we have this data available. We looked at the last five years worth of data and we looked at some of the parameters such as water source quantity and quality, water source type, complexity of the treatment system, a system adaptability to changing water source chemistry, which could be an impact because of the drought of the fluctuating water uh, systems and operator training certification and record keeping in terms of um, you know, uh, how much of a uh, grip we have on the current state of the water system. So we took all those key performance indicators, combined them and created, some, created a desktop analysis of a ranking study. We shortlisted 34 communities as a starting point to get the conversation and do the outreach. So that was phase one. Um, and once we had finished that phase one, we identified those 34 initial communities. We stepped into phase two, which was um, essentially an outreach. So we did an outreach internally where we um, asked our community senior engineers and capital management officers to get in touch with their contacts um, in the community to see how are the communities, uh, you know, faring in this uh, uh, situation of drought. And, and is this, you know, and this is also ground proofing some of this, the desktop analysis that we had done initially. And, you know, what do we hear from communities and what their experience is in reality? Um, so, so this is work is ongoing. So we have done the first leg of um, the outreach. The second leg of the outreach is we have included an enhanced drought questionnaire uh, in this year's annual performance inspection to get to capture some of that knowledge and you know, the, some of those vulnerabilities um, for the water system so that we can plan um, for, for the next year and the next coming years, you know, be it short-term um, in terms of updating emergency response plans to some long range planning items such as water system upgrades. So what are the expected results? Uh, based on a uh, similar analysis that was conducted in 2015, we expect the number of vulnerable systems to be reduced significant by phase two work. So our experience has been that once we have done the outreach, most of the water systems are resilient. Um, the communities are keeping an eye on their system to see anything, any weaknesses that may show up. Um, but overall, it's in good condition, uh, uh, the state of the infrastructure. Um, but whatever vulnerabilities have been identified, we will be looking at it and trying to respond to it, in a, you know, be it in ERP or water treatment plant upgrade the next uh, stages of this activity. So for medium term, um, what are some of the key, um, key criteria here? Um, it's uh, the priority will be for any communities identified at the end of phase two assessment, but any community can apply for support. So of course, uh, we will focus with what information we have out of stemming from those phase one and phase two activities. But if there's any community out there who are facing some of these drought impacts, by all means, reach out through your usual ISC channels and contacts, be it circuit rider or community senior engineer and CMO. Um, so work with continued work with community partners to support the preparedness activities, which, include, which is inclusion of drought and emergency preparedness plans, uh, making sure that they have a focus section on the ERPs if, if that doesn't exist already. Uh, develop and implement monitoring water, uh, monitoring of water systems for water quantity. So this is especially uh, important for uh, vulnerable groundwater systems and also surface water systems to make sure that they have an idea how uh, those water systems are fluctuating year over year. So 
uh, the phase two will help us identify these specific needs and where do we need to focus in terms of having some of this, uh, um, uh, you know, planning efforts and you know, project efforts completed. Um, and of course, the repairs and upgrade of systems. So this is more in conjunction with the leaky distribution systems. We want to make sure that distributions are distribution systems are tight and they're they're not wasting water when the water is in in you know at a high premium in those particular situations and you know in keeping in context the water restrictions as well. Um, a focus program to identify the repair and leaky water systems, of course, and the continued collaboration with First Nations partners including support for water conservation, education, and outreach work already underway by partner agencies. Again, we will keep on continuing to collaborate, keep on uh, coming on platforms like this to raise more awareness as to how First Nations can uh, reach and, you know, um, and coordinate with us. So I will, like, you know, I will give this to, uh, give the platform to my colleague, Anthony, at the next couple of slides. Uh, we'll talk about sort of the emergency management uh, component. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, yeah, just sort of moving on. So a bit, a bit of a general overview of the emergency management program for ISC in BC region. So we, when we operate our program using a number of agreements and um, with a number of our partners, so important EMCR, we obviously we work very closely with them. Uh, we also work closely with the BC Wildfire Service. Uh, and one of the, the key ones is the Tripartite Memorandum of Understanding on Emergency Management. Uh, which is between ISC, the First Nations Leadership Council, uh, and the province of BC. And that's to ensure that First Nations are, are kind of full partners in the in the EM discussion and, and how the, the, the program is managed and how it's moving forward. Um, in terms of the uh, how, how we're structured, um, so the, the EMAP program, the Emergency Management Assistance Program, um, basically operates on the four pillars approach. Uh, we provide funding to First Nations in relations to natural hazards and emergencies. Obviously, the probably the most obvious one in recent years, wildfires, uh, flooding, uh, and other severe weather events, of which, you know, obviously drought is becoming more of an issue as well. So the, the key thing is, uh, is it an event? Is it a prescribed event, um, which... Drought again. We're we're in that territory now, where where, and that's why we're having these conversations. So obviously, the four pillars that we work with, and we've got a number of funding streams for, for each, is preparedness, mitigation, uh, response, and recovery. Um, so if we move to the next slide, a little more detail on each. So in in terms of response, um. The thing, and I mentioned a moment ago that we have a number of agreements in place. Uh, ISC doesn't have boots on the ground per se to deal with emergency events as they happen uh, and when they impact First Nations. Uh, we contract our colleagues or we have an agreement with our colleagues at EMCR for much of that. And, and as I said, BC Wildfire. Um, we work with and support communities in their response work through those service agreements. And Finesse, again, is another key partner in that in that whole uh and that whole equation. Um, the good, I mean, the good news for First Nations is that sometimes things that are not eligible for EMCR are eligible under ISCS program. We have a bit more uh, scope, if you like, to be able to cover certain things that the, that the province can't. So we, uh, you know, through our terms and conditions of our program, we are able sometimes to fund things. Uh, and, and, and again, we've had a lot of experience of that in recent weeks, things that the province can't cover, we've been able to cover with some of the big events that have been going on. Um, so, and what we'll do is we re reimburse uh, communities fully for, for, for those costs that, that we can cover. Uh, the big thing is that our program is limited to one reserve. So it, it can only, it's only when an event impacts a reserve. So again, if that's the, if that's a drought, uh, we we can be involved in that. If it's off reserve, the ISC program is is not able to assist at that point. Um, the preparedness part of our program, and I think this probably is where uh, we can have an impact with drought more. In in terms of, we have a, an application uh, uh, program, um, the the non structural mitigation program, which is an annual program that we we receive an allocation from from Ottawa. And it's basically by application. And uh, 
it, it it's basically it's open until the money is is, is gone basically and on, on a kind of first come first serve basis based on eligibility so an smp is designed for uh, to to assist first nations create and update emergency plans so that in in the context of what we're talking here it could be a drought plan or a, or a or a plan for dealing with drought would be under the nsmp uh, program um it can be used for uh conducting exercises um again tabletop exercises again drought very much could be part of that um training um for staff and, and community members uh hazard risk and vul vulnerability analysis again drought would definitely fall into that into that category uh things like flood plain mapping um the program can also be used for low valued uh em equipment so anything under five thousand dollars uh we can we can cover uh the larger pieces of equipment machinery we you know uh, we would pass you on to our our colleagues in community infrastructure also things like tsunami sirens so so i think i think in terms of the context of 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 uh drought that program would probably be the the, the funding mechanism you you'd use for us um we obviously then have a, have a recovery piece as well uh when an event has taken place and again probably the the vast majority of, of the funding that we use at the moment or have at the moment would go on um the impacts and recovery from from the wildfires um so again we work we work closely with first nations in dealing with those events uh we don't have the funding in the region we have to uh basically get approval from our colleagues in ottawa and they basically forward us that money and then we reimburse for those costs or we cover those costs of recovery um so and again a, a lot of the time that's related to infrastructure so again possibilities working in tandem with ci that if there's some infrastructure specific to the to drought, that might be something that we could we could investigate uh, through the recovery portion of our program. Um, so again, just a very broad overview. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions, and happy to talk offline uh, with with people as well. And I'll I'll I don't know if you've got more, Raul, but I'll pass back to you. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, so by all means, you know, in question and answers, we can definitely answer any questions that the audience may have. Uh, but also, if you require more information on the drought in, uh, in, in terms of the drought impacted infrastructure, please use your usual channels to communicate with ISC, uh, be it your community senior engineer or community, community capital management officer. Um, if you don't know, contact me. I will. My email address is right here. I'll also put in the chat, and I'll put you in contact with the right person. And of course, Anthony's email is uh, here as well, which I'll put in the chat, and uh, uh, the generic email and the phone number for the ISC Emergency Management BC region. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Daryl had asked. Prolonged power outage, is there a specified number of hours or days before support is considered? And they will be installing the auto transfer switch through Hool Electric. Are there opportunities through IS to purchase the specific generator required to connect to these switches? That was a question in the chat, I think, to ISK. Um so, so in terms of power outages, I would say the urgent O&M typically kicks in when there's an event that is out of the norm. So let's say it was, it was a planned power outage, um, then it's part of the planned activity. But if there's a trend where it's, uh, it's becoming uh, more and more current and it's not planned, then I would say that you know, this is where it, the, you know, the community can approach urgent O&M. So this is, um, again, a separate funding unit. What I would recommend is... Uh, uh, you send in the request uh, to Danny Higashitani. So he's the lead person for uh, doing an urgent o &M. And of course, um, um, in, in, in you can send that query to me and I can forward that on as well to get you further guidance on that matter. Thank you very much. Um, if people have questions, uh, if you could either use the raise your hand and if you're on the phone, um, perhaps just politely jump in. So uh, now it's the time for any questions on any of the uh, three presentations. I know it's a lot of information to 
to take in all at once. Maybe while we're thinking of that, um, I have a question if uh, if uh, there could be a brief uh, kind of an overview of the First Nations engagement on drought, um, both provincially and federally, that might be uh, good to briefly outline. Ian, do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, and uh, specific to um, uh, the EMCR info uh, that we presented, so uh, all of the uh, info uh, that David presented, uh, first off, uh, was run through uh, our partners at Finesse uh, to make sure from a uh, planning perspective uh, that we were hitting the mark. Uh, and then, uh, as uh, David pointed out, uh, that information was then uh, shared uh, at our seasonal hazard uh, prep meetings, uh, which uh, allowed for further feedback uh, before we sent out uh, the final uh, product. Uh, and that was prior to uh, the uh, significant wildfire impacts from the summer. So while I, I wouldn't call it uh, formal engagement, uh, given uh, how quickly, you know, we all had uh, uh, back in the spring an inkling uh, that we could see uh, road activities pick up, but it was largely hin uh, hinging on what type of rain we may or may not see uh, in June, and we all know that we didn't. Uh, and I believe uh, there are some further uh, consultation planned as the interagency drought working group continues its work, but that's the information I have currently, uh, Casey. Thank you, Ian. And Rahul, I, I remember your presentation talked about the outreach and the 34 uh, community water systems. So I'm assuming there's been a, a quite a bit of outreach uh, done to communities as well. Uh, right, uh, Casey, you know, so so we started off uh, by having that engagement by sending out those information sheets. So that was our first, um, you know, first sort of exposure uh, to getting in touch with the communities. And as our strategy matured internally and we had a better idea or at least some idea as to how we can proceed, uh, we, we started c connecting with those communities, those 34 communities initially. And of course, at this point, this, the efforts are still ongoing, and and you know we are we are still, uh, you know, connecting with the communities as part of our ongoing programs. So, an annual performance inspection being one of them is we have sort of um, uh, taken that program and made it so that communities have that platform available in case that conversation and you know something was missed through those initial outreach. Um, um, outreach effort. So these we're trying to have a sort of a multi-pronged approach uh, to you know to to get to the leadership in the communities through email to chief and councils, but also uh, through our API program where you know we, we interact with the operators in the ground. Thank you very much for that. There's a question in the chat: Are these drought conditions in cycles, or are we preparing for a long-term drought? i.e. five, 10 years or longer? Uh, hey, Casey, it's Connie from Mr. Force. I can I can take a stab at that, but I do just want to cycle back just on some of the, the outreach and engagement and communication and just specifically acknowledge that um, Mr. Force staff and other technical staff are directly working with um, bands on a day-to-day -day basis in very stressed watersheds. And there are many partnerships that have been formed and any recommendation that goes forward to the minister for decision when it comes to specific orders often involves um, engagement with the nation and or them being directly part of the package for the, the, the nations that are directly within the impacted watershed. 
Um, so there is a lot of um, ongoing partnerships and engagement and formal consultation as needed as per the Water Sustainability Act, but really without some of the partnerships that the province has with the nations, we wouldn't have uh, been able to respond in the manner that we did in regards to the current drought scenario. Um, <clears throat> in regards to the current drought conditions, I know one of the earlier questions at the beginning of the call was in the space of, is this one of the worst droughts that we've seen? And within our modern record of 10 years, this is um, trending in that direction. And one of the key things with this year's drought is that we've seen it widespread across BC. Most of the time we've seen it localized to basins. So 2015 was another year where we saw very similar water levels and trends. Uh, we just saw it more localized to the southern half of the province versus seeing the vastness of reaching corner to corner. Uh, we have had, I guess, 2021, we had quite, quite a drought season in the south south half of BC um, and we did see some fall rains in September which alleviated that that condition. Um, from 2022 to 2023 we've currently seen uh, very low levels of precipitation over the years so we're trending below normal in regards to how much rain we see fall over 365 days and going into last winter in a deficit definitely uh, was one of the contributing factors to the the, the drought that we've seen this year, in addition to the um, that early early freshet that we saw, that really warm May, and then just that uh, lower levels of precipitation um, fall over that year. So if those trends continue and we don't see um, that increase in the rains or increase in the precipitation falling as rain and seeing some of that recharge, we could be into a multi-year drought cycle. Right now it's a little early to say whether that's, that's the case or not. Definitely watching the climate patterns and working as closely as we can with Environment Canada um, and climate change to understand their modeling and so forth. And maybe on a future call, we can get them on to talk about some of what they look for as they help uh, the River Forecast Center and the province just with understanding um, the weather cycles. Thank you for that, Connie. Putting out another call, uh, for those that asked your questions during the introductions, um, I know there's been a lot of information provided. If your question has been not fully an uh, answered, um, now's a chance to uh, to raise your hand and ask, and it's okay if they've all been answered. We're six minutes before the end of our scheduled time. And before we conclude, um, under the non-structural mitigation program, I've worked on a few of those over the years, and I know the uh, staff at ISC are very open to receiving drafts because it's kind of a new thing, these uh, ERPs for drought. Um, it's a little bit out of my knowledge base. So um, I'd, uh, I'd suggest people make sure you talk to ISC and, and uh, get feedback on the applications, which they will, uh, they'll provide. If there's no um, last questions, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time today. I'd like to thank the communities for the hard work, the partner agencies, and uh, the presenters for the information. We can circulate a link of this recording, we'll edit it, and we'll attach the PowerPoint presentations. And then you can share that link with others that weren't able to join this workshop. So have a, have a great afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.